and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Please remember to visit the website podcastufo.com for past episodes, blogs, and forums. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello, everyone. This is Martin Willis, your host. And we have a great show for you this evening. Alejandro Rojas is coming up in just a minute with the news. And after that, we have Leslie Kane and Jose Ley, And we are going to be talking UFOs and the Chile government. And it's going to be pretty interesting. We're going to be taking calls. And that's at 603-967-4030 for the live show. There's also a chat room at podcastufo.com. You're welcome to pose questions there. And I want to thank everyone for supporting the show. People who support the show for only a dollar or more get to listen to the whole entire show, which is uh, two hours long here. You can listen to the first hour free, as always. And you can listen live at the Dark Matter Radio Network, always for free. And uh, I am going to draw a T-shirt next week, only because I'm not prepared for that. A winner for a t-shirt is coming up next week. And so we are going to roll right into the news with Alejandro Rojas. And what is going on, Alejandro? Oh, my gosh. There's What's not going on is that there's a lot going on, buddy. <laughs> yes, yes, always. And we are going to steer away from the uh, UFO slide news. There's, uh, I'm sorry, oh, the uh, Roswell well then- slide news. Then there's, then no there's nothing going on. <laughs> there's nothing. No. Yeah. yeah I was I, aware that you wanted to avoid that, so I do have other stories. Oh, that's good. You know, I corresponded a little bit with Kevin Randall today and congratulated him on a nice show on your podcast. Great interview. I suggest anyone shoot over to openminds.tv and listen to that podcast. And uh, he did a great job, and, and I, I said it will be really interesting in the future to look back at this and see, you know, what has developed all through these tangled webs mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, cause things just, uh, things are kind of crazy on the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And listeners of your podcast, of course, will hear a, uh, recognize a familiar voice at the beginning of that, uh, podcast where we reviewed the news and, uh, you know, we've replaced Jason with you. I know. You know, I am totally honored by that. I really, uh, I was so thrilled when you asked me if I'd be available to do that. And it's on my lunch break. I don't have the best mic, but, uh, but it, oh, it, it sounded great. I think it worked. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, Jason's going to be sorely missed, but it's sure going to be a lot of fun talking with you during the, the, the news every week. Yeah. I'm probably, you probably got some hate mail from some of the Jason lovers, but, uh, I don't no want to know hate about mail it. thus far. What's that? That I've seen. There's no hate mail I've seen thus far, but I'm not one of those guys who goes into all the social media and reads every comment and everything. So no. there might be some out there, but if there is, I am blissful, blissfully ignorant of it. Yes, please keep me blissfully ignorant. I don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> nice place to be. Yeah. So what is going on for the news this week? Yeah. So uh, some interesting stuff. This is a story that actually has done very poorly on our site, but this is funny because it's been picked up by the news out there, uh, and people probably read it, and this is has to do with uh, the PGA tournament, which actually was about a week ago, the Players' Championships, where there was a viewer who believes he caught a UFO, um, that he saw a UFO while he was watching this. He recorded it with his phone, so we recorded the TV that he was watching with his phone. And uh, so that's all we have. And actually, Lee Spiegel of the Huffington Post found this in the Move On archives. So he wrote a story about it. Uh, so it, it's in the video, 
You do see a bird fly by, you see the golf ball flying up in the air, and then you see another object in the air. And uh, that's what this guy thought was pretty mysterious. And it does look, you know, kind of dish-shaped. And he said, you know, he couldn't figure out what it was. He knew it wasn't a blimp. He knew it wasn't this or that. Uh, So Lee wrote about it, and it got out there pretty well. Now, uh, Mark D'Antonio, the photo analyst for MUFON, took a look at it. And here's why. Even though when I write about UFO stories, I'll often, get, you know, get a lot of hits in it, but I'll put, you know, what the uh, skeptics or maybe a, an analyst had found, and uh, people will still look at the story and they'll debate it. Whenever I put what the object possibly could have been in the title, people won't even read the story. It's kind of funny. Really? But, wow. uh, yeah. So I put UFO at PGA tournament might be a birdie with a Y. Of course, I know birdie in golf terms is IE. But that's because this thing is most likely a bird. I don't know if people have followed, you know, I think even some of the stories you and I have talked about. A bird in flight when its wings are kind of even with the camera and the, you can't see its wings above or below it looks cylindrical. It looks kind of, it looks cigar shaped. It looks, uh, you know, elliptical, uh, really with points at two ends. And, and that's what this looks like it is. In fact, I think in the video, late in the video, you can kind of see this bird kind of bank and fly off. So that's what Mark felt it was. And, uh, others disagree. Some, uh, you know, can see that it's a bird, but, uh, this is a story that got quite Quite a bit of news. Well, uh, that will be in the video and everything will be connected in the story. Oh, yeah. We've got the video and everything in our story at openminds.tv. Okay. And we'll have that link in our show notes. And I just want to know a thing. Was, you know, Tiger Woods abducted or anything? Do you know? No, Tiger Woods was not abducted, but... uh, he these days he kind of he he just is so uncomfortable and unhappy out there uh on the in the field it seems like uh he's just not the tiger woods he used to be unfortunately and uh he probably wishes he were abducted yeah <laughs> no we don't need to go into that whole situation <laughs> <laughs> yeah um uh, all right so what else is going on All right, this is really cool, and the fun thing, here's the advantage that you have. Since you come and do the news with me on Monday, uh, and then I come on, you know, later in the week to talk to you, there's sometimes, of course, newer stories or further developments on stories we've had. So I do have a further development than what we talked about on on my show to this next story, and that is we we had a guest review of the Area 51 movie. Um, and this was done by a guy named Theron Moore and a really cool guy. He has a website where he talks about rock and roll and stuff like that. Uh, some hardcore kind of rock music, but what he did, um, he's into UFOs and he's a big fan of ours. So, uh, he wrote this from a UFO person's perspective. Someone into UFOs. So he talks about how in this new Area 51, it's a found footage film made by the guys who made Paranormal Activity, which, of course, is huge. Um, And everybody knows about these movies, Paranormal Activities. So this is kind of similar where these guys go in, sneak into Area 51, see aliens and all this stuff. So what's interesting is that there are pieces from actual research in the film and there are a few UFO researchers. So Glenn Campbell, Norio Hayakawa, and George Knapp are in this film. What's funny is when I posted this uh, review of the film, you know, I tagged Norio and George Knapp. Norio was laughing because he's like, I these guys, I talked to them for 10 minutes or they did some filming or something like that with me years ago. And I thought the movie wasn't even going to happen anymore. So he's like, I just found out about this myself. George Knapp, when I posted it, said, what? (laughs) You know, he seemed completely shocked. And uh, just the other day, I think just yesterday, he posted about a paragraph on my Facebook to explain what he meant. I guess something like three or four years ago, they sat down and they had the main character interview him while they filmed the main character filming George Knapp, you know, and they filmed that. So it was because it's found footage thing. So he said that he had forgotten completely about it. 
he didn't think they were going to use it or the film was even going to get made because so many years had passed. And this was even before Paranormal Activity. So we saw, you know, since his interview with them, they've become these big stars or and their movies became so huge. So he didn't know what was going on. So he only just found out that they used some of that footage they shot many, many years ago in the film. So kind of funny, kind of cool that you'll be able to see some UFO researchers in this movie. I haven't seen it yet, but I do want to see it uh, for that reason alone. The, otherwise, the reviews are mixed. There's lots of people saying uh, Theron, uh, the guy who wrote the story, liked the movie. And uh, so we have some people saying that he's full of it and the movie was awful, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's how it goes with movies. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it myself. Now, Paranormal Activity was released in 2009. So mm. um, so this should be going way back then. When yeah, it said it was a, a long time ago. Yeah, how about that? So, um, yeah, you know, I mean, this is interesting. But also, you know, keep in mind that I don't think anybody could sneak on Area 51. They have ground sensing uh you know, alarms and... <laughs> oh, that's, that's something I forgot. Yeah. That in the interview, George Knapp did say he has an idea of how to sneak onto Area 51, but he told the filmmakers in that interview he wouldn't tell them what that idea is because he doesn't want anybody to try it, and then he'll get in trouble when they get caught or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that, absolutely. <laughs> but so you're we, right. doesn't seem easy. Yeah, I don't think so. I know... Uh, I'm trying to remember his name. He's he goes to a lot of UFO conferences, and I got to talk to him. I want to say Austin or something like that. Real fun guy. Anyway, he said he just jumped over the line and jumped back just to say he could do it, and then got in his car and drove off. That's <laughs> funny because I did see a video uh, just the other day, and it says crossing the line at Area 51. So I watched it, and it's these guys in this mo- in their motorcycles. They go to the to the area where the sign is and they're kind of hanging out there then one of them goes past the sign just a few feet and then they all take off and they go as fast as they can and get out of there (laughs) so kind of funny they weren't chased or anything but of course there are some or many people who have crossed the line who have gotten in trouble and had to spend uh some time in jail for that that's right it was chris augustine i don't know if you happen to know him Oh, it sounds guy. familiar, yeah. Yeah, great guy. Funny guy. So what else is going on for the news? The other one is this uh, UFO inside of a building. So uh, this is a U.S. Spacewalk of Fame Museum. They caught on their security cameras twice in one week uh, these orbs inside of their building. And, uh, you know, one of the videos, the most impressive, shows this orb coming off camera. It moves and then it kind of turns around and comes back and then goes on screen a little for a little bit longer. Uh, the director of the museum says they have ghostly activity there and he thinks they're mysterious. He says the guy that installed their security system doesn't know what it is. He said that their AC system was off, so he doesn't think it was something blowing around like dust or something like that. So he believes it to be a genuine mystery. Uh, so uh, it's gotten a lot of talk and a lot of people looking at these uh, interesting videos. You know, I was wondering about that after I was on your show the other day, whether this um, this place had any type of, you know, air uh, ventilating system, because that's, mm-hmm. you know, it sort of moved very quickly, uh, almost yeah. like something would move into a gust of wind of some type and then move the other way quickly. But, you know, it by golly, it could just be an orb. You never know. It could. Who knows? And then, of course, because it's a space museum, people have said maybe it's an alien. Um, But uh, it's kind of more along the line of what the ghost hunters are kind of looking for. But uh, pretty interesting video. It's a fun video. Uh, This story's getting out there. So I definitely recommend uh, recommend people at least take a look and tell us what you think. Yeah. You know, they're all excited because it's it's getting some press. Um, You know, they'll probably get more visitors and and, and all that. You know, realistically, I think it's probably some type of dust particle. They just they just need to figure it out. And um, I'm sure if that's the case, though, they will see it again because they recently moved into this new building. They haven't been in there that long. so That's right. It's an old building, uh, but they have not been in it, in it that long. And they didn't get into detail, although maybe he's been interviewed again 
uh, by now. Uh, this is in Titusville, Florida, by the way. But uh, he, they do say there's been other, you know, what he believes to be ghostly activity in this building. That's right. And this week, a little later on, you're going to Contact in the Desert, and you're speaking, right? That's right. Yeah, this weekend I will be at Contact in the Desert uh, at the Joshua Tree Retreat Center. It's kind of near 29 Palms uh, in California. So hopefully people will be there. I'll be speaking Saturday night and Sunday morning. Uh, Both of these I think will be fun. Like your regular ticket will get me into my Saturday night lecture. And that's going to be about really strange ET cases. Oh, man, and I would love for you in particular to see this talk sometime because I cover, you know, of course, uh, people will know Martin and I are are on the skeptical end of the scale, I think, when it comes to UFOs. Um, However, what I cover are abduction cases and alien contact cases that have made a real difference in how people think about this stuff and or mostly unknown or not very well known at all, but are, or are very credible. Like that happened a long time ago before this phenomena was even really known about. So they're really compelling cases and interesting and strange. And so they really, even for the hardened skeptic, like, like us, you know, make you scratch your head. So, uh, I think it's a really fun talk. And then, um, um, I've done it at the local MUFON, and I developed it specifically for a crowd that's, you know, more into kind of the fringe type of stuff. And then Sunday morning, I'm kind of being more tight-lipped about the topic, but it's about the absolute strangest abduction case I've ever been involved in. Uh, and I'm kind of just doing a workshop where it's like, here's what I happened to me. What do you guys think? Am I being fooled? Is this a hoax? And if so... How can we account for some of these things that are really strange, including some of my personal experiences attached to this? Some people who are you know about my research and the more controversial stuff I've been attached to will probably be able to uh, figure out which case I'm talking about. Yeah, well, you got me wondering here, so I'm going to have to check that out sometime. Alejandro, thank you so much. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you next week. Yeah, twice. <laughs> Talk to you next week twice. All right, everyone, hang in there. We'll be right back um, after the music break with Leslie Kane and Jose Lay. Okay, I want to apologize, first of all, to everyone. It seems like I've been doing that a few times. But uh, this time, it was a microphone problem, and this show almost didn't happen by about 15 seconds, literally. No joke. Um, we just got it cranking just before that. And uh, luckily, we got it fixed. And so I have uh, Leslie Kane and Jose Lay. They are on Google uh, like a Google chat, which I've never used. That was another challenge. But uh, can you hear me there? Leslie. I hear you fine, Martin. Hi. I'm fine. I hear you also. All right. So how is the volume? How's this volume, Martin? Is it okay? Everything seems to be fine on this end. They'll let us know in the chat room. Also, uh, listeners, just to let you know, um, we're going to allow calls tonight. If you'd like to call in, that's 603. Nine six seven four zero three zero. Just quickly, Jose Lay. We've had him on a few different times. I got to meet him, uh, as well as Leslie, down in North Carolina um, two or three years ago. Now it is, and Jose is the international affairs director of the CEFAHA, that's Chile's official agency. I hope I pronounced that right. Investigating UFOs, and of course, Leslie Kane is a well-known journalist. You all know her. Um, New York Times bestseller. Um, her great book, I think, is the book out there, myself, on UFOs. Generals, pilots, and government officials go on the record, and they will be the guests. And they're here right now. So glad to have them. And we're going to be talking today about a new story. Uh, Leslie, why don't you go into this story as you just published this in the Huffington Post recently? 
Okay. Well, thanks a lot for having us on, Martin. Um, and I don't know how many listeners have read the story, but it is on the Huffington Post right now if anybody wants to log on while we're doing the show. And um, it's basically about a case from the that the CEFAA, which is Jose's agency, which is part of the Chilean government, investigated very, very thoroughly uh, with the help of lots of different people, which he can tell you about. But just to give you an overview of the case, um, it took place in September of 2012, and um, it took place at the Air Force War Academy in Santiago, Chile. And we refer to it as the AGA case, A-G-A, because the AGA, A-G-A is the acronym, is the initials for the Air Force War Academy, which in Spanish is the Academia de Guerra Aria. I don't know if I said it right, but anyway, so the AGA refers to the academy where it took place. And basically what happened was there were three witnesses to um, a sighting which involved three different formations. Um, it, there was a sergeant involved at the academy and a paramedic and an emergency medical technician who we can refer to as the EMT. Uh, the two, the me paramedic and the EMT came to fill up their ambulance with gas at the uh, academy because they have a pump there and the sergeant was assisting them and they saw these lights coming in over the andes mountain so which are very large mountains that you see everywhere in, in santiago it was nighttime it was um early in the night about um i believe it was around 7 45 p.m so it was dark um and the lights basically came over the mountain and at first they thought they were helicopters but quickly realized, especially the sergeant who had been in the Air Force for 27 years and was very experienced at dealing with helicopters, realized quite soon that they were not helicopters. For one thing, they were completely silent. And the lights drew closer, and they witnessed them form, a, first of all, a, a horizontal line. There were five lights, then a triangle, and then a circle. And during this time, two of the, the paramedic and the EMT actually pulled out their cell phones and were filming them. The sergeant was kind of running around. He was very kind of frightened and responsible for the security of the base, so he was he was calling out for the guard in the guard post to come out, and he was just very alarmed by it. And um, they all described. Eventually, there was there was a lot of interviews, and we can. I don't know how much you want me to go into actually what happened. That's actually the nature of the case, and then. Uh, what happened was after it was over, it took a couple of minutes for them to witness these things. A general came by, happened to come by the AGA, the Air Force Academy, shortly after the event. Within five minutes, he was just dropping something off, and he was able to interview the, the three witnesses and observe how absolutely shaken they were. He said that the sergeant was just at, was white. You know, they were, they were really, really disturbed by what they had seen, particularly the sergeant. And he was able to report and file a written, a written statement about that later on. But it was very important. The fact that there was this very credible person who came by so quickly. Um, and then the, the director of the academy was called. He came over within 15 minutes. And so that's what happened the actual night of the event. So phase two is, is describing what happened during the investigation. Well, we got, we got plenty of time on the show here. So, uh, Jose, uh, when did this first get reported to you? When did you first hear about it? Uh, first of all, uh, good evening, Martin, and the audience, and Leslie. Uh, we learned about it the very next day, uh, first time in the morning. Our work started at 8 a.m. here, and uh, the director of the academy, he phoned uh, our director, General Bermudez, exactly at 8 a.m. next day. And the, and the investigation started immediately. Hmm. Hmm. And the one thing for the listener that hasn't heard this before, this uh, Sefaha, if I'm pronouncing that right, I know it's something like that, um, is an amazing uh, government agency. And why don't you explain a little bit more about that? I know we've talked about it here a number of times, but, you know, we have new listeners coming in all the time. So if you wouldn't mind... Uh, telling us what the government agency is and what type of uh, support you have. Well, the, the agency was created uh, 
within the Air Force first, and uh, due to the fact that uh, especially DJC was uh, receiving many reports from pilots and uh, air traffic controllers of uh, unusual sightings being uh, made uh, very frequently, and especially one that was very uh, spectacular, so to say, that happened back in 1997, in which uh, a whole town practically uh, was witness to, to the phenomenon to, in order to, to channel all the information that was coming in. And for that, uh, we were created with the faculty or the right to know immediately any, any sighting made by either commercial pilots or military pilots or ground crews that were in charge of radar or ground controllers, air traffic controllers. That was the beginning of the CFAA. And from there on, we had to 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 try to call into the committee as many scientists as possible. We already had the the support of the DJC because they we, we were enclosed uh, within the DJC in order to be able to deal not only with the military uh, pilots but also with commercial liners that uh, had been also reporting their unusual sightings. So it had to be a mixed committee uh, to, to take charge of the investigation. We, we also needed the academic support of our scientists, and for that we made a call uh, to all the universities here, and we were very lucky because the answer was very positive. Right now we have a, a large group of scientists, including a, a national science prize and two reputed uh, astronomers that each of them, by the way, has a, an asteroid name after their, after their own names. And uh, the committee right now consists of a mixture of scientists, uh, Air, Air Force people, uh, DJC specialists, engineers, and so on and so forth, and uh, the the whole structure of the ground control in Chile is also available to us in the in the sense of radar and ground controllers, air traffic controllers. So basically, that, the, that is the structure of the CFA. And in order to, to be able to communicate with the different branches of uh, the armed forces, each of the branches has uh, detached a representative in order to receive whatever happened within their own specialties to, to refer it to, to us and the CFAs. So everything is centralized, whatever happens uh, in our office. That is, that is in, in resume what we are. Uh-huh. Uh, and I think it's an absolute wonderful example, and hopefully other countries will fall. Leslie, um, you have really advocated for this to happen, other countries to follow in the footsteps, basically, of Chile. Can you talk a little bit about that? Have you made any progress by exposing um, what they do to other countries? Well, um, I want to answer that. I just want to clarify one thing first. When Jose was referring to the DGAC, probably people don't know what that is. Um, um, and the DGAC is the Department of Civil Aeronautics in uh, Chile, just so, to give people that clarity, which is underneath the super, underneath the purview of the Air Force, so it's within the Air Force. It's kind of like our FAA. So the, the mm -hmm. CFAA is basically a department within the equivalent of the FAA here. So, so to answer your question about, um, I, I definitely have been, um, you know, one of the reasons I feel that it's so important to make the work of the CFAA 
known is because I do feel that they are set such a good example for the world in terms of how an, an agency can operate very efficiently and get a lot of work done and do great investigations with all the resources available to them without it costing a lot. And it's just, they, they do it beautifully and seamlessly there. Um, and so I have, you know, the work that I do behind the scenes in Washington, I mean, I, it's very, very difficult. When you say, have I made any progress? I would say some progress, but it's really, really slow. And um, there are certain people that are interested in this who I can I inform about things that go on. And, and one of the important components of that is the work of the Chilean government. But making progress in Washington is not an easy job. So I, I can't really, I don't know if I can describe it as progress except on a small scale, but you never know when a break will come. You never know when that moment will come where something can give. Right. And it's just a matter of, for the people involved who really do want to support this effort that I'm making, um, for them, it's they only can do what they can do given all the circumstances that they're involved with. And so it's really, a, so much of it is a matter of timing and the positioning of various people. And, you know, it can ha it'll happen when it can happen. But there's so many factors that affect it. Right. Uh, so that's just, we just have to be very, very patient. But I do, th but I, I can't emphasize enough, the more that people can learn about how agencies like the one in Chile operate, which they really are unique in the world. I think the, the better informed we all are to hopefully have something like that happen here when the time is right for that. Right. And, you know, you being patient and thorough, uh, I'm sure it means a lot to the people that you're quietly dealing with. But what happens when something, you know, fringy makes the news? I'm not going to – we all know what happened recently. <laughs> but how does that uh, – how do yeah. these things set you – do they set you back, or do you just immediately address it with the people involved that you're talking to and just say, you know, this is, you know, crazy. We understand, you know, there's some – most of the people in this field are not – thinking in this manner or something like that. How do you address that? Or do you? Um, it really isn't necessary. It's just not necessary, Martin, because the people at the higher levels in Washington that are interested in this do not pay any attention to the kind of shenanigans that go on. I mean, it's just, it's not on the radar screen. And if it does come up as a little blip, uh, they know. It's so obvious mm -hmm. and so clear that it's not necessary for me to explain anything to them. I see. Uh-huh. And what about other... Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not concerned about it. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> now, what about other governments? I mean, I mean, yeah. Yeah. No, no. Do you want to elaborate more on that? That's fine. No, I was just going to say, I mean, it's unfortunate when these things happen. I certainly don't think it's, you know, it's, it's definitely an unfortunate thing. And, um, but... I think that so much of what I'm doing is sort of outside of the whole realm of the UFO, ufology world, that whatever goes on in that sort of self-contained world I don't think is really significant for for this bigger picture that I'm – I mean, I don't mean necessarily bigger, but it, it just doesn't impact the world, the work that I do very much, wow. if at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the more sophisticated people can see through it, that's the thing. I mean, the more sophisticated people who are outside of the UFO world and the ufology world can see right through it. So it just doesn't have much effect. I think it has much more of an effect within the self-contained world that ufologists have created for themselves than it does for those working outside of that. Mm -hmm. You hear a lot, a, lot of, a lot of times you hear that we need to drain the swamp. <laughs> you know, you hear that saying a lot. But um, I just want to tell the... Um, listener out there, if you'd like to call in, you can call in and ask Leslie or Jose a question, and that phone number is 603-967-4030. We have a question up on the message board um, where um, someone wants to know, after you published your book, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record, have you gotten a lot of new stories from credible military personnel since that time? Well, actually, the most important stories I've gotten are from Chile. 
So I, I keep very, I've gotten very, some very interesting stories from, from Chile that I've actually published on the Huffington Post. So I would encourage that person to just go to the Huffington Post website and search my name, and you'll find those stories. And really, since the book came out, my main interest has been to observe and learn more about the work of the, the French agency and the Chilean agency, mm -hmm. those, two, those two areas. And there have been some great cases that have come from those. I also want to mention to people that I'm not sure Jose Lai is going to be able to stay on too late tonight, so I'm hoping we can maybe turn the floor over to him a little bit more. Okay, okay. I can always stay on later. Okay, sure. Um, so, Jose, have you, just as, just um, throwing this question out of my hat here, have you, have you or your agency, I should say, worked with other government agencies or, or consulted with them about um, how to approach what you're doing? Well, we basically based our ideas and principles in the French agency, J. Pong. And uh, because they are the, the oldest agency, official government agency in the world, uh, established a long time ago, they, they evacuated uh, a report called the Cometa Report of which I think uh, uh, Leslie can, uh, can talk about. And uh, we started from there. We didn't intend to, to recreate the invention of the, of the powder, you know, the gunpowder. And uh, we were based basically on them. And then we started to, to adapt their methods to our own idiosyncrasy here. That was it. Mm -hmm. No, no and other. Then you've, since then, you've had a meeting with the with the French, though, right? Oh, yes. talk, that's oh, a, very, yes. a very historic event. You might want to mention that. Oh yes, uh, our director, General Bermudez, he he was invited to uh, to the French agency, Japan, together with the civilian uh, agency, or so, so to say, private. Uh, French agency, which is the uh, uh, Sigma 3AF, that belongs to the private air and space industry in Europe or France. So uh, that was really important, and we currently have uh, relations with 14 countries. We also consult. Uh, with a specialist, uh, foreign specialist, in some cases in which we have our doubts. Now hold, hold on. We have so it is with fourteen countries we are hang on. we are cooperating with. All right, hang on just a minute. We around have, the world. Hang on, Jose. We have a caller just called in. Thank you. Hold on, Jose. Caller, welcome. Hello. Uh, this is Philip in uh, Jackson City. Uh, I have a question for Jose and Leslie. Um, uh, over the years, uh, I keep hearing that there's this huge uh, group in China of uh, organized, you know, ufologists or an organization, a, a huge organization in China that studies the phenomena. What do we know about it? You know, and is it really? Is it? Is it? Uh, does it really exist? And and does any any information come out of out of it? Uh, yeah, it seems like uh, that that large population. It makes sense that the that would that you know that, that would be the case, but I just want to know if you guys have any you know have have had any encounters or communications with with that group. And thank you, Leslie or Jose. Yep. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Um, did you hear the caller? I didn't hear it. Okay, no, no, no problem. Anything. I wondered if that might happen. That's kind of why I wanted to test this. Uh, the caller wanted to know if um, you, and, and thank you, caller. I'm going to uh, I'm going to let you go now. Thank you, Philip. Okay. And, uh, let's see. Um, the caller wanted to know if you've had any talks or anything with a Chinese group. It's supposed to be a very large UFO-involved group in China, and he was wondering an association of some kind, if you've had any interaction at all with, with China. Well, we do have interaction uh, 
uh, with China in uh, an official manner through the Chinese uh, military attaché in, in Santiago, in our country. Uh, we do not have any contact with uh, the, any, any uh, how we say, civilian group in, in, in China at all. The problem is <coughs> that we have to know the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'm sorry, everyone. Poor we have to know the background. Go ahead. Uh, I think we have to know first the the background of the, the of the group, the members that uh, there are in. For example, in the United States, we have contact uh, with NARCAP. We also know very well Dr. Richard Haynes. And uh, he has uh, cooperated with us uh, for a long time now, NACAP. And uh, it is difficult to, to contact uh, uh, Chinese uh, civilian groups that are studying the subject because uh, not of the language barrier. I know Chinese. The problem is that the... We don't know anything about them, uh, and uh, actually, with civilian groups, we do not have contact in China. We we would love to, of course, but uh, as you know, there are many, 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 many so-called ufologist groups, and we are not interested in them at all, actually. Oh. As uh, Leslie mentioned, the, <laughs> their own uh, world, we are outside of that, uh, of that circle. Well, I have to ask you um, why you take that position. Well, because to tell you the truth, we do not like speculation at all. We think uh, uh, if we did... We will go uh, to integrate uh, into a very mixed bag in which uh, the, the, it, is the, it is so polluted by, uh, I don't know, I, I, I don't know how to say it. I don't want to offend anyone. Uh, we prefer to, to keep it the way we are so far. We, we, do, we do not uh, make great affirmation if we do not have great proofs. Sure. I, you know, I understand all that. I just wanted to hear what, what you had to say. Now, there's a message um, up on the message board asking if Chile thinks they are actually dealing with craft from off-world, and if so, how do they make the findings I'm sorry, let me try to read that again. How do they make their findings public? No, first of all, uh, by law, we are required to, to give every information we, we, we receive. That is uh, by law. And we do. And the, the French agency does the same. We see no reason whatsoever to hide anything. However, to speculate, that is another, another thing altogether. We cannot expe speculate on, on where it comes from or what the phenomenon is unless we have clear, universally accepted uh, as true. Perhaps I'm not explaining myself well. Uh, no, no, no. I, but we can, um, so... I guess um, I'll, I'll rephrase the question um, in, in a little bit of a different way. Has there been any situation where Sefaha has just said, this has to be, or most likely, uh, <laughs> that's, well, I guess it goes back to speculating. But like the uh, French report, um, the Cometa report that initially got Leslie interested in this topic, you know, they one of the the best theory that they had, hypothesis that they had of the situation, is that it's um, a, an extraterrestrial 
situation. Uh, unless I'm quoting any of this oh, right, yeah. wrong, Leslie. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely an hypothesis, though it was an hypothesis, not nothing that was proven. Right. Yes, they they do uh, take that as a hypothesis, and we do accept the hypothesis. We accept it. However, we cannot say this case or whatever it is is exactly what people may think might think it is extraterrestrial without the necessary proof. We have been puzzled several times, very much puzzled, like in this Aga case. Mm -hmm. However, we cannot prove it. And therefore, we are not going to say this was indeed extraterrestrial. I don't know. I, I'm not sure whether our listener will, will understand that. No, no, I think they will. Um, now, I'm going to go on, on a wild topic, but um, semi-related or, or associated, I should say. Um, has this agency ever looked into people's claims of abduction? Don't get mad at me, Leslie, for asking. <laughs> <laughs> I think Leslie is, is a person more indicated than me. No, I mean, I don't even know if Jose, Jose even knows what that means. And so the answer is a big no. Okay. He probably doesn't even hardly know what you mean by that. Okay. That, that's a big area of research in this country, but not in, not, they're not associated with that at all. Ah, that's what, that's what I wanted to know. And what about... But uh, I mean, maybe Jose wants to speak for himself, but... <laughs> <laughs> Jose? I think... Uh, forgive my interruption, I think you mean abduction in the sense that uh, an extraterrestrial uh, being or beings have kidnapped uh, an earthling or something like that? Right. Does that? Well, we cannot say anything about it First of all, because our mission is to study the phenomenon, mm -hmm. not the only only the, the the nature of it. However, since we do not, we are not able to prove the existence. I mean, of the nature of the phenomenon being extraterrestrial, we could hardly believe in any case of abduction at all because first we have to to learn about the, the nature of the phenomenon itself right okay so let me ask you this question as well while we're on a similar topic or has the Chilean government ever looked into some of the major cases that have happened uh, reported that have happened in different countries or do they no, just our mission is... And the reason I'm asking... We, we have to... Go ahead. Uh, we have to stick for obvious reason, either economic or, or by, the, by the, the amount of information we have here nationally, only to within our borders... Okay. Uh, hang on just a minute here. I have, to, I have to make an adjustment here. It's going to make some noise. Hang on. Um, and, okay, go ahead and talk if you would. Well, our mission is to, to study the phenomenon that is that are reported by our pilots, either civilian or military. That is our scope. Uh -huh. However, the, the, the people keeps sending their own cases to us, of course, to our office, because after we were uh, created, the so-called ufologists started slowly but, sh but surely disappearing from the map. The thing is that people uh, at large, they, they finally know that they get nowhere with uh, wild theories or things like that. And uh, they no longer 
uh, go over to to some uh, ufologists to to let them know their experiences or or show them their their photograph etc cetera, etc cetera. and the only thing they they accomplish is to to grow up the name of the so called ufologist to to start uh, profiting by it you see uh-huh they finally found out that that is the true about uh, the so called ufologist well known ufologist or not very well known before i can i can tell you in this country we have uh, a big amount of them going in television uh, being interviewed in the press and all that but no longer is the case because of because of the government uh, because of this agency um the, so the the question i had and the reason i had the question was like for instance you hear a lot of things happening in brazil which is a neighboring country and i've just wondered if you yes. it, it seems to me that you could be teachable by certain things that happen or you could learn something and i just wondered if you ever pay attention to what's happening in neighboring countries well first of all we do have relations official relations with uh, several countries in south america uruguay brazil peru uh, the their their own argentina uh, their commander in chief of uh, of the air force have been have been visiting the cefa who inspired the peruvian agency and the argentinian agency to to the extent that the Argentinian agency uh, put uh, a name is called Cefa without the uh, last a you see mm-hmm. and uh, and we know uh, about the brazilian cases of course uh, but they are mainly they came mainly from the special division they have in, within the air force that is in charge of registering all those cases that can actually uh, gather the the largest amount of information possible like radar reports or sighting reports by their own pilots we know all about the uh, operation prato for example which is a very dramatic uh, uh, sighting made in, by the brazilian air force as dramatic as the belgian air, uh, air force uh, report mm mm-hmm. mm-hmm. so we are familiar with some of the their cases yes now um I, there's a message up on the message board that I'll ask you in just a second. But um, so I'm going to ask you this little bit of a fringy question, <laughs> and uh, that is: Has anyone ever reported that you're aware of that they saw any type of beings in these crafts or on these crafts or on the ground? Or <coughs> has has beings ever come into any of the reports that you have looked at seriously? No. All right, well, that was a quick answer. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Jose, we have a few minutes left here for the first hour, and then we take a real quick music break and jump into the second hour. So the question to you is, do you want to hang out for the second hour of the show or a little bit of it? Or oh, are, yes, you, I will. are you? I uh, would like to, Martin, because I, it is a pleasure talking to you. Oh, that's that's really nice. Yeah. And just to let the listener know, poor Jose has been very sick, and he still wanted to go through with his show tonight. So you'll have to apologize him for giving a, a cough here and there. Um, okay, up on the message board, um, Shane wants to know, what are your group's findings in general at this point? And um, I don't know if I should word that better for you, um, Jose. Uh, let's just say... What is the overall findings of the group since uh, this has been taken ser- seriously? I don't think I, I, I really understand very well the question. Sure. Leslie, can you think of a way to, to ask him that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they just want to know, Jose, what is the sort of conclusion or the position that the CEFA has regarding the phenomenon 
Oh. As a result of all the work that you've done, you know, what is your sort of position on the issue? Well, our conclusion, yes, yes, they, they, we have concluded. First of all, the phenomenon exists. That is for sure. If we are to trust all the many reports of, of very re responsible people, reliable people, such as uh, many, many civilian uh, commercial pilots and military pilots, it is impossible to discredit them all. So the phenomenon definitely exists. And that drew the attention of our scientists. It is a phenomenon that has not been explained so far. That, it, that, is a, that means a challenge to our men of science, men and women of science. That is a challenge. But the existence of it is undeniable. That is the conclusion we, are, we have reached so far. And that is why we exist, in order to find out, by all the means we have, we are a very small country, remember? Mm -hmm. To find out the truth. What is it exactly? Right. And let it known to the public. I was. Uh, that I was, would be my answer. I, I was in. A, thank you for that. I was in an office yesterday, and there was this older gentleman that was in marketing and like a Harvard graduate type of uh, gentleman. And and I said, "Oh, I have to do a recording on a show." Uh, I was recording with Alejandro uh, Rojas for his uh, show, and so he asked me, "Well, what do you do the show on?" <laughs> and I said, "UFOs." And he looked at me uh, with this look like. Um, I was out of my mind, and so I just looked at him and I said, you know, the, something is happening, and I'm not going to say that I know what is happening, but it's a curious uh, situation and something to look into. And, you know, that's kind of my answer to someone that wants to uh, think this is a total fringe thing, that something is definitely happening because all of these people cannot be seeing something that, is not existing. You know, it's just an impossibility. That's right. Yeah. So I fully agree with that. Yep. So we're ready to take a break right here real quickly. Welcome back. We're on the line with Jose Ley down in Chile and also Leslie uh, Kane in New York. And we are talking in this hour, continuing on. And I believe I had a question up here. Yes, this question is uh, for you, Jose. Um, is, are there any cases in the Chilean cases that have actual physical evidence like landing traces or anything like that? No, 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 no. We only have one report from a air traffic controller who was uh, on the tower in one of our airfields who described an actual landing because of the dust that he saw spreading around. But he was so far away. He, he was... He was overlooking at the Andes Mountains, 
and he was calling at a radio center to to see what whether they could detect what he he was actually seeing and uh, that case also we have the tape of the actual conversation between the the air traffic controller with the radar center and the radar center could not detect uh, <clears throat> what he was seeing but that was a long time ago around 1978 or something like that Oh, I was just going that to... That is the only thing of a, of a landing, the description of a landing. That is the, the only one we have. No physical contact, no... Uh, nothing else whatsoever. Just flybys, uh, change of directions, uh, uh, near misses with change of direction at the, at the last moment, described by the the crew uh, aboard the plane, and we have all the recordings because as soon as uh, anything unusual happens, the uh, radio centers or, or the, the ground controllers all over the country, they send us the, the information together with the, with the recording of uh, in real time of what's going on. And you can see that in in our friend Leslie King page, web page. Yeah, on, on my website, I have um, a, a, a number of those tapes with subtitles put on them, so you can actually hear the exchange between the pilots and the ground. They're really, and, and you can hear the pilots describing what they're seeing. Those oh. are really interesting. I just want to add too to what Jose said about the evidence. So even though they don't have ground traces, in terms of physical evidence, they do have a number of cases with very interesting photographs, and they also have radar. So although that's not really physical evidence in the sense that the questioner meant it, it's still very sort of concrete, hard evidence showing the physicality of of the object. And they've done some really great photo analysis. They have some great experts that do photo. Anal analyzing for them. Mm -hmm. And um, for instance, this AGA case that we've just been talking about has, has video. And there's other cases that have video, and there's some cases that have still photographs. And those are really, really important because they're so well vetted. Mm -hmm. They're not just like something you find on YouTube. You know, these are cases where they've vetted the witnesses, they know who took the photographs, they're turned over immediately, uh, they know everything about their chain of custody and how they were created, and, and they're usually involving very, very credible people. And then, of course, they have their analysts uh, do, do in-depth studies of the photos. So they're, I, I value the photos a lot that come out of the CEFAA. Now, how, uh, uh, Jose, how far back have you looked <coughs> At cases, historic cases, um, this one you just mentioned was back. I think you said 1978. Have you gone back right. further to cases that were um, that were really unexplainable? Oh, well, I have uh, participated in many conferences here, uh, and I have found people. Uh, very old people that have told me about things that are really unusual, you see, uh, but we have not been able to uh, to go into them because the, the witnesses, they are long time gone, you mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. And uh, But for example, we have one, one case now that involves five commercial airplanes, not military airplanes, commercial airplanes, with a total of 10 witnesses. And we have the recordings wow. of the five airplanes describing the same phenomenon. Wow, that's that's a great... That's, that's for example, we, <laughs> we are interviewing every pilot, every co-pilot, and they, the whole crew on, uh, on those. And I will like to, to, to thank and stress the point of the cooperation of all the commercial airlines here. Mm -hmm. They are willing to cooperate with us because we, we are not biased. We have no 
no problem in in, uh, in taking them very seriously. Here, uh, our Air Force and Navy and Army pilots, even the police pilots, they know that they are not going to be considered as uh, weird or crazy or something like that, even uh, though they, they report something extremely unusual. And the psychologist, for example, in the Air Force, is a member of our committee. And the Army psychologist is also uh, a member of our committee. And they are familiar with the subject. Mm -hmm. And at the medical level or psychological level, the phenomenon here is accepted. Because yeah. the, the witnesses are entirely reliable. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Leslie, when did you first get in contact with the Chilean, this um, office, or did they reach out to you because of your book? Um, it was actually when I was writing my book. I'd had some contact with the office prior to that, though, because for years before doing my book, I was very interested in connecting, you know, making contact with government agencies. And, and um, I had done a couple of interviews with General Bermudez um, over the years before my book. And then when I actually was writing the book, I invited him to write a chapter. And of course, General Bermudez being the director of the CEFAA. So he wrote a chapter for the book. Um, and then when there was a case called El Bosque, which was the first case I reported on after the book came out from the Chilean agency. Um, and I, I, forget, I think that was in um, maybe 2011 when that case, uh, I, I, it was about three, three or four, you know, between three and three and a half years ago was when I really became more involved. Uh, and that, that was when I was reporting on that first case, which I wrote a number of articles about for the Huffington Post. It was quite controversial. But, and that was the case that involved some video that was taken during these um, air, an air show over one of the Air Force bases. So ever since then, I've been extremely interested in the work of the CEFA. I've been invited to come down on numerous occasions, and I've sat in on meetings and been briefed by General Bermudez and have been sort of kept on the inside track of what's going on there. So I'm very uh, familiar with how they work and have been given confidential case files and things and, and feel really um, privileged to be sort of considered, you know, one of the group there in a certain way. But I also maintain enough distance that I can report on it from a journalistic perspective. But also I'm just being being given a lot of information, and I value that very highly. Okay. Um, Leslie, for some reason there's some major static. Someone on the uh, message board just said it was the NSA. <laughs> um, and <laughs> yeah. And it just seems to it happen. It wasn't there before, and it is now. Uh, Leslie, I'm going to have to ask you to uh, hang up and then try to reconnect with uh, however you just did it um, earlier and see if we can fix that issue real quickly, if you don't mind. Okay, go, so go just, just... Wait a minute, wait a minute. If, if I hang up, I might lose no, you no. guys, or... It seems to be working uh, now. Okay, it, it just stopped. Now the, the, the problem is, seems to be is gone. It okay? It seems okay. okay now. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I won't move. I won't move. <laughs> no, it's uh, really a very, very strange sound. I'm sure all the listeners thought the same thing. Uh, it sounded very... Were you able to hear what I just said? We heard most of what you just said, but it, it sounded very alien-like, and I am joking, okay. yes. Okay. Uh, Leslie, <laughs> um, is it true... Oh, someone just moved the message. Hang on. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, whenever, anytime someone um, puts a message in, uh, you lose the message above. And I, I had a question for you directly. And so, um, while I'm trying to get that sorted out, um, what was the case that uh, initially got this, um, got Sefa uh, in gear? Was there a certain case that happened out of nowhere that all of a sudden um, the agency decided to take hold? Jose? I think that's a question for Jose. 
the, the case, Jose, that, that made the CEFA a form, he just wants to know a little more about that, that incident that, that up north where, where that's oh, the yes. up north. That happened in Arica, which is a, a, our farthest northern city port. People started calling about uh, a phenomenon was, that was going on to the airport to, to find out whether they could actually see something. From the tower, the air traffic controllers, they saw it. And to make sure of uh, what they were seeing, they consulted with an army airplane that was coming in to land. And uh, the pilot of, I mean, the crew of that aircraft, they had seen that uh, phenomenon as well before they were requested to report on it. And they had decided to keep quiet about it. Hmm. And that was the time where you, you, you could run the risk of being rounded by in accused perhaps uh, of seeing visions or something like that. So they had decided not to report it. But since the ground control was asking about, about it, they decided to cooperate and they answered that actually yes, the, the phenomenon that was going on was actually going on. Ah. And we have the recording of it we have the recording of it, the actual recording of the conversation that went on between the tower and the aircraft. That was it. That, that was, let's say, the drop that spilled the whole glass. So then there was an urgent meet, meeting in the, in the Air Force, and they decided that it was time to start to, to investigate the whole thing. Wow. Um, because if it was a foreign uh, man-made, so to, to, to speak, phenomenon, that meant that our airspace was being violated without our not knowing. Hmm. You see, they, they, that was, I think, the main reason for creating our, our committee. That's something. Our group. Uh, we had a caller just tried to call in, and I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm working off two computers. I missed you. So, caller, if you'd like to try again, I'll try to catch you this time. Um, um, so, Leslie, um, did I see, I'm just going to change uh, change tracks here just for a second. Did I see someone um, uh, write a book about your work? Uh, not that I'm aware of, Martin. Um, maybe it was an article what? about your work recently. Um, no? Recently? Yeah, very recently, within I don't like a think month so. ago. Someone announced something, um, uh, something they were writing about you. And you're not aware of that? It's possible. I no, maybe it's something I don't know about. <laughs> okay, now I actually got an announcement through an email, so I'm going to take a look after the show tonight. And uh, send that to you because maybe it's being done without you wanting it to be done. But uh, it looked like it was. Yes, please it, do, Martin. Yeah, it looked like it was something positive, though. I will put put it that way. Okay. Um, okay. So. I um, excuse me. Sure, go I'm, ahead. I'm interrupting. Uh, there was one article, Leslie. Perhaps you don't remember that mm -hmm. appeared uh, it, it was some sort of a short ebook i think oh well yeah. maybe it's the ebook yeah is that what it is i Martin? think so that you're so you he knows more than i do about it if there is an ebook that was published a couple of months ago on it's on amazon it's called Op um unknown skies is what it's called maybe that it was it uh, it sounds but it's it's something that was already already released by a man named Steve Denoso, who is basically an interview with me that was consolidated into a ebook that he put together. That's so exactly that it. That may be it. 
That's exactly it. I know for sure. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jose. Yeah. I just oh, spaced it out. I spaced it out. He I'm can sorry. barely speak. You but know, I he, know. I, I, English is a second language, and he cracked it. Yeah. Yeah. How about that? I know he speaks beautiful, speaks better English than I do. Lots of the time, lots of time, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but um, no, I, I was really pleased with that because um, it sort of gives a more up to date perspective from me, um, from you know what I have to say since the time my book came out. And I think he was the the person who put it together. Just wanted to sort of bring it up to date and talk about some of the work I've been doing the last couple of years. And get my current thoughts about various things. So that's what that ebook is. It's really inexpensive too, if anybody wants to go on Amazon and check it out. Uh huh. Now, Leslie, do you have something else in the works or thoughts of something more in the future, as far as this topic goes? Uh, I, in terms of this topic, um, I don't really have much. I mean, my, my ultimate goal is, of course, to try to bring the United States government around to, to the right position on this issue. And I'm not going to stop working on that. Um, it's just, as I said earlier, you have to be very patient and take your take your moments when they come around. Um, and I want to continue to work with the material coming from the CEFA. Oh, there's another really fantastic case that the CEFA has on the on their burner now, which we can't talk about yet, but uh, it's really, listeners really phenomenal. Aren't gonna like that. And I can't wait until, <laughs> yeah, I can't wait until I can report on that one. And nothing, they they always take a while because the thing is, Martin, they do such a thorough investigation of every case that it really takes time, and they're they have they're in no rush to to you know get the word out or anything like that. They take the time they need. To bring in all the experts from all these different areas, and do a really good investigation. So that's there's one underway right now, which um, is is absolutely fantastic. And so I look forward to bringing that one forward when the time comes. And I don't think it'll be too much longer, but I don't really know. Now, okay, now everyone makes mistakes, and I I, I know I do believe there was. I, I just want to talk quickly about wasn't, and I may be totally wrong about this, but wasn't there supposed to be a major sighting at an airfield with these jets flying over and wasn't that in Chile and didn't that uh finally get analyzed as insects or am I thinking of something else no you're thinking of the El Bosque case I don't know if Jose wants to comment on it but just to say there were there were analysts and anal- analyses made by maybe five or six people on that case all of them experts and okay, there was about Leslie, a 50-50 split. Ha- hang on, Leslie, yeah. please. Um, so I had a message last time the static happened from the show producer, and he said it was your microphone that does that. And he says you may have to plug in and unplug it and plug it back in. Or would you be able to do that and, and do the setting yeah. again yep. to make sure that uh, works? And um, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to ask Jose, to, while you're doing that, to continue on with that case. Can you talk? A little bit about that, Jose. You mean uh, about the El Bosque case? Yeah. Was that finally figured out as insects, or is that still unknown? <laughs> no, it remains unknown because uh, there was a there was not an absolute agreement, even within the the committee, and also. Uh, Although we have very, very uh, uh, prestigious foreign analysts like uh, Dr. Bruce McCarry, who went uh, through the videos, and uh, we decided that to leave it to leave it open for the time being, uh, in effect. <coughs> We published it because we had to in the first place, and we published both theories in our webpage. Those who thought that it was an object, and those who thought it was firmly an insect. And it is very interesting the article made by Leslie Kane because she even in. Uh, contacted uh, uh, some 
exploiting in, in insects in the United States. So uh, now it, uh, it remains a very interesting case for which we do not have definite proof, actually. So, uh, and that, that is a good thing in the, in the end because, as, as I told uh, the audience, without definite, universally accepted proof, we are not going to make a, a, a final statement about any one of our cases. Okay. Leslie, are you back? Okay. Leslie, are you back? Yes. yes. Can you hear me better now? Uh, no, your your mic is off. We're getting feedback, so just make sure the mic setting. Yeah. Try. I one. did. I checked the mic setting. And it, uh, can you hear me better now? I think so. I'm not hearing feedback. Um, yeah, I heard the feedback before, but I don't now. Yeah, it sounds good. Is it good. okay? Yes. Okay, Leslie, here's a question okay. for you. And uh, uh, I cringe while I'm asking this question, Leslie, but I... Uh, it's up on the message board, and um, if one person's asking, a lot of other people will want to know probably. Um, how would you compare your efforts for disclosure with Stephen Bassett's? Uh, please, please don't yell at me for asking that. That's okay. I mean, first of all, I'm not making an effort for disclosure. Okay. So that's that's a big difference right there. That word disclosure I find very distasteful and and I don't have any relationship to it. And I'm not working towards disclosure in the sense that he defines it. So basically we're just on completely different paths and I I uh, I, I just disagree with him about the way he approaches it. He's drawn conclusions that I don't think are acceptable to draw. He approaches members of he thinks he's approaching government officials. I don't think they really pay attention, but making claims of extraterrestrial contact and, and all kinds of statements that he considers to be real, but that government officials don't take seriously. And so he really isn't, I think, informed about the proper way to approach government. And so so that's, those are the main two differences. I, I feel feel that I've had a lot of training from public relations firms in Washington and people that I've worked with, and I've learned how, how to talk the language of government officials. And number two, I'm, I'm not involved with efforts towards disclosure. So those two things are the main differences. Thank you. Um, that was a good answer. And let's see. Uh, there's uh, someone up on the board also that wants to know, have either you, Leslie, or Jose, either one of you ever had – witnessed anything unexplainable yourselves? Well, I'll say no for myself, and then I think Jose might have a more interesting answer than I do, but I, for myself, I, w I haven't. Uh-huh. How about you, well, Jose? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. But as I, as I am a member of uh, the CFR, I, I cannot say uh, I saw... Uh, uh, an extraterrestrial thing. I just saw uh, a luminous phenomena, and that was it. Mm -hmm. it. It could not have been a, a meteor. It was. It was uh, during summertime by the seaside, and I saw something that I also mistook to be a, an helicopter or something like that, but it wasn't. <clears throat> I see. However, I cannot say further than that. That was surprising, yes. It was surprising. Ah, yeah. Now, did this happen before you got involved in this, um, in the Sethaha, or was it during the time? No, it was a long time before. I see. Before I joined. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Leslie, another question is uh, coming to you after the last comment, asking if you advocate secrecy. If I advocate secrecy, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so this I person, this person I obviously is, don't advocate secrecy. Okay, this person was uh, uh, putting it in the context of disclosure. And, I, you know, I basically have an idea of what you're going to say, but I, I just thought I'd let you say it in your own words. Uh, I'm me, not sure I understand let, the okay, question, Okay, let, let me reword it. I mean, it. I don't advocate secrecy, of course. Yeah. Uh, this okay. is uh, 
uh, I'll put it this way, and I'm putting the words in the mouth of the chat room here, but do you advocate secrecy over disclosure? That's the context of it. Uh, I don't. I still don't really understand the question because okay. disclosure is not something that I really relate to. I don't. They have to define what they mean by disclosure first okay. of all. Okay, uh, disclosure. Um, I guess for me to understand that okay. question. Okay. Yeah, we'll probably move on, but I'll just try one more time um, to get the the listeners' um, question across. All right. Say that um, we're going to say. Uh, all right. So Stephen Bassett is trying to get disclosure, so the government admits that it knows something about the UFO phenomenon. Um, do you think that idea is a good one, or like, uh, for instance, Stan, Stanton Friedman um, thinks it's not a good idea that uh, uh, that there are some things that uh, people shouldn't get their hands on if they're available to get their hands on that type of thing. So, does that question work any better for you? Um, I'll try to answer it. I mean, it's not completely clear to me, but I think, think that what when people talk about disclosure in the way that Stephen Bassett defines it, they're not talking about the government acknowledging something about UFOs. They're talking about some kind of moment where a government of a country stands up and says uh, extraterrestrials are here and they've been here for since the 40s and we've been covering it up. I think that's what he... Mm -hmm. expects to happen when he – and so the question is, do I advocate secrecy? I'm not even sure if there is a secret being kept, Martin. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly the governments of Chile and France are not keeping secrets. Now, it's as I wrote in my book, and I have a whole chapter about this, and so if people really want to understand my thinking about it, that would be the best way to understand it because we don't have much time here. But in a nutshell, it's conceivable that there are major – secrets being kept by the government uh that and, and it's conceivable to me that there are not either way either 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 aspect of that could be the case and i'm not we don't have enough evidence in my opinion to assume or that our government is keeping this big huge secret um it's not enough evidence to satisfy me as a journalist. I'm not a ufologist. I'm a journalist kind of looking at this from the outside in, and there's never been evidence that's presented to me to convince me that anybody can prove that. It, it might be an interesting thing to speculate. There might be all kinds of belief systems that people have or conclusions they've drawn based on their own uh, perceptions about the issue, which is fine. They can do that, but it's not enough to, to prove. And as Jose has said, it's got to be a universally accepted proof. And so the conspira the ideas of the conspiracists have of, of government cover-ups and, and bodies being retrieved and all of that, there just is no proof of that. There's not enough hard evidence for it. So it's possible, but from, I'm not interested in something that I can't, that I can't document, back up, and be certain about. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't advocate secrecy because I'm not sure if there's a secret being kept. And if there is a secret being kept, of course I don't advocate for it. I believe that any secrets about this issue should be released, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing what I do is I, I want all the doors to be open. I want all the, the information to be released just like the rest of us do. I think the only difference I have is I'm not as convinced as, as some are that there is a huge secret being kept. I just don't know. You know, I, I don't know whether there is or not. Okay, I hope well, that answers the question. I think that totally answers the question, uh, and thank you for that. <clears throat> One of the people I had on um, probably about two and a half years ago was a gentleman from Sweden and their UFO group over there. His name was Klaus Swan. And he, um, they have the largest UFO reference library in the entire world. I forget how many uh, f uh, feet of uh, bookshelving there is, just full of uh, UFO uh, books, where people from all over different countries, you know, will stop in and research. Uh, he also was telling me in an interview, and it's almost like there should be some type of introduction because he was saying that. They take it serious there. There's never ridicule. Um, they, they look at the topic serious. And I just wondered, have you ever looked into uh, Sweden as far as one of these European countries that look more scientifically? 
Um, I'll ask you, Leslie, have you ever looked into Sweden? Yeah, well, I know that Jose actually, Jose has a relationship. His, uh, Jose, doesn't the Sefa have a relationship with Klaus? Is, is it from Norway or Sweden? Uh, that he Klaus has? Norway. Norway. Klaus Fahn. Yeah, Klaus, I think. Yeah. Klaus Zvan. Uh, Jose yes. has, a, has a working relationship with him, I believe, from the Sefa, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, he contacted us a long time ago. Uh -huh. We found out uh, his background in, in through Dr. Richard Haynes, who had visited the library there, and uh, we decided that uh, we will cooperate by sending our material to to that library as well. Oh well, that's wonderful. Yeah, he is. Uh, he is. Uh, it is in Sweden. Um, but yeah, that's, that's wonderful. But, uh, you know, I, I do remember him mentioning that they will turn to him many times for some type of sighting or something that's on the news and he will be interviewed and he says he's never been ridiculed, which I think is totally fascinating mm -hmm. and, and very unusual. Well, he probably takes, he probably remains very level headed about it too. And doesn't, doesn't create, uh, make a lot of wild claims like, you know, that extraterrestrials are communicating with pre former presidents of the country and things like that. Um, I mean, he probably doesn't go off on these these tangents that would would lend themselves to ridicule, I assume. Yeah. You mean they're not, Leslie? <laughs> I'm trying to have a little fun. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's for sure. Classes one doesn't speculate. Yeah, that's why he and I, I encourage people out there that regardless of their personal beliefs, Martin, I mean, if you want to believe that Eisenhower met with aliens in the desert, you know, fine, you can believe that. But if you're talking to the, the media and you're talking to the political establishment, that is not something you should talk about. You have to be you have to pick what you're going to say. And I, I've written articles about this, and I would encourage people to just be very discerning to separate their personal beliefs from the line that they want to take in, if they expect to have a positive influence on the status quo. Uh -huh. There's a, there are two different things. You can believe what you want, but you got to say only certain things and not other things if you want to have, have a forward motion with this issue. And that's, I think, what a lot of people have trouble separating okay. their own belief systems from what is appropriate to actually say. Uh, uh, Leslie, I know you're not going to be able to hear a caller, but we have a caller on, and I'll, I'll uh, pass the message on to you. So, caller, uh, please introduce yourself by first name, and uh, go Hello. ahead and pose your question. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. My name's – I have a long issue right now. Lou, L-O-U, last name is Sheehan. That's all right. First name is fine, Lou. First name is fine. Thank you. Does Ms. Keene – uh, does she have any updates on the current status of the Belgian Triangle photo? There was a gentleman who oh, yes. subsequently, many years later, claimed it, he had faked it, but right. originally it was established as being legit. So that's right. my question, and I'll, I'll listen to you off the air. And thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lou. Sure, sure. All right, uh, Leslie, so the question was, did you have any updates on the Belgian triangle photo i remember i believe we talked about this at one point where at one point they thought that photo was legitimate and then later on discovered that it was not do you have any any new facts on that at all i don't have any new facts i don't know to what extent the caller is informed about it but just all, what i know happened was i think it was in july of 2011 um yeah, it was right before, about a month before my my this documentary that I was very involved with, this two hour special for the History Channel, came out in August of 2011, and we featured that photograph in that piece. And so one month before that, the and it was a famous photograph that had been vetted by all these laboratories. I mean, it was just it was really a shock when the the, the shooter came out in July of 2012 and announced that. He had faked that fic picture, that he, it was a hoax, that he had created this model out of styrofoam and flashlights to build the object. And none of the photographs, of course, could, could you know, absolutely eliminate 
that the physical object was a hoax. They could eliminate that there are any wires or anything that they could discern in the picture. But it was, um, so that's basically what happened. And some of the Belgian investigators went and spoke with him and he was not able to recreate it. They did ask him to recreate the picture and he mm. wasn't able to do that. And he did, wouldn't do it. Did he try to uh, There were two other witnesses, though, that said that, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, we have a delay a delay here. Did he try to recreate the model and showed the model to anyone? Well, well, that's the thing. The investigators asked him to do that. They said, well, okay, if you built it then, build it again for us. And he wouldn't do it. He claimed that the kinds of light bulbs that he used then were not available. I think that was his argument. But there were a lot of issues involved with this, this photographer being in a big court battle with the person who had the copyrights to the photographs. There was a lot of background to this photograph that was unpleasant, and there were there was a fight going on, and it's conceivable to me that it, we don't know for sure that the photo was hoaxed. We have to assume it was because the, the guy came out and said it was, the guy that shot it. But it is conceivable to me that he may not be telling the truth and that maybe it was a genuine photograph, and because he's angry with the person who owns the copyright who's been making money on the, the photograph, it may, there may have been some kind of dirty business going on there. We don't know. We have no way of knowing, unfortunately. So we have to assume that it was a hoax, but it's, it's very complicated, and I think there's always the possibility that it wasn't. But we'll probably never know, so we have to, as I said, we have to make that assumption. It's, it was a, a, a really shocking... Uh, development. And no, I haven't heard of anything more recent. I think the Belgians looked into it and there was really nothing more they could do basically within yeah. the first six months of a year or so of that discovery being made. Uh, very shocking though. I have to tell you that was hands down my favorite UFO picture. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, yeah. I was I really. Well, my favorite is the the Costa Rica one. The Costa Rica photograph from 1971 is will never be proven to be a hoax because it was a government photograph taken from a government airplane, and that's my all time favorite picture. I am uh, as we're moving along here. I'm going to try to find that because I'm, I don't know if, for sure if I know of that one. Um, well, it's the it's the first picture in my book, uh, Martin. It's the first picture oh, okay. in the photo uh, insert to my book. Yeah. Okay, I don't have that right here with me, but okay, I see it. Wow, yeah, that's an amazing picture, and I'll pull that up up yeah. and put a link into the um, into the uh, chat room so anyone can take a quick peek at it. Um, so. We have just to let you know we have about oh I don't know maybe fifteen minutes or something like that. And uh, we're welcome to go, uh, you are welcome to go into any further topic in any direction you want to go. Leslie, is there anything that you think is uh, pressing to get out there to the public in any type of way as far as the subject goes? I know that's a loaded question. Uh, not really. Uh, you know, I just I keep beating up on the same drum. I think that you know, having Jose lie here on the line is is a very precious opportunity, and I, I just can't stress enough the the importance that I see of of government agencies like the one in in, in Chile developing around the world. And I think if we're going to solve the UFO problem, that's the only way it's going to happen. And of course, the United States being central to that to the need for gov uh, more government involvement so that resources will be liberated within the United States right. for uh, scientists to become involved with, with this. And, and be, until our government opens the door even just a crack to, to allowing uh, the, you know, acknowledging the, the, just the, the value of an investigation, uh, our, our, we're going to have that door is going to remain closed. And I think Jose will agree, although they are doing tremendous job, they're a one small country, as he said. And I think that General Bermudez and Jose Lai both agree that the United States needs to come on board. It's very, very important for that to happen. All right. Hang, you want to comment on that, Jose? Hang, hang on just one moment. Yes. <coughs> Pardon me, both of you. Can you hang? <coughs> Uh, hang on just one moment. We have another caller. Caller, go ahead. Uh, say your first name, please, and your question. Lou, yet again. Uh, why doesn't Ms. King tell us more about the chili photo that she likes so much, the background 
um, the context of it. That would be interesting to hear. And is she worried about uh, the U.S. government undermining the Chilean effort, like they did with Allende in the political sphere? And I'll take my answers off the air. And thank okay. you for your time. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a two-part question, Leslie. Um, the Costa Rica image. Uh, he wanted a little more elaboration. Um, what you, you know, what you thought about that, uh, the credibility of it, and and all that. Secondly, um, has anyone worried that the Chilean government would undermine any part of the Chilean government would under undermine Sefaha as they move along? Well, why doesn't Jose take the second part of that? Jose, is okay. there any part of your government that could undermine the work that you're doing? I do not think so. Absolutely not. First, <clears throat> because more than 85% of our population believes that the phenomenon does exist. So it would be a very bad policy to erase us from the map now. And secondly, because we have uh, already had uh, been invited to our security uh, council in our country, and the people who uh, who made the, the questioning and things like that, senators and deputies, many of them, if not to say all of them, they also believed in the phenomenon. So I don't think our government is going to, to take a decision to just uh, eliminate the CFA. It will, it will be a national uproar. Okay. And, Leslie, the other part of that, um, you've sort of explained about the image, but you can go into a little more detail if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, it's, if, if anybody looks it up online, they'll find a lot more information. But it was, um, there was a mapping plane, a geographical mapping plane that was flying over Costa Rica. And so they had a camera strapped to the outside of the airplane. And the, the, the work of that camera was to just snap these different shots of the ground. They were sort of making a grid and documenting the layout of the ground, and like every, I don't know, 15 seconds or every certain amount of time, the camera would snap. And it was what's interesting about it was a very large negative because they were trying to get as much detail as possible of these shots of the ground. And in one of the shots, there was this disc that showed up in the image very, very clearly, again, because it was such a big negative, which meant it had high resolution. And what was interesting about it was that it was underneath the plane, most shots of UFOs, you're looking up at the UFO, but this one you're looking down at it, which is really interesting. Um, it was it was analyzed by experts. There's a lot of information that was able to be determined about it. You could see the way the sun is hitting it from a certain angle. It was you know, they were able to determine things about the speed, et cetera. And the the important thing was that it was a government airplane. So the uh, the and it was just one shot out of many. So we know that it was completely legitimate, and um, wow, that's that's really the most important thing about it. Yeah. Um, the, the chain of custody is absolutely top top of the line of that photograph, and if if people, anybody has my book, it is it is reproduced in the book, All um, right. but you can probably find it online too. Well, we have. May a, I add something? Sure, go ahead. Concerning that case, yes, we have the written report from an, uh, a retired colonel of the Air Force, who was in a similar mission. Unfortunately, the, the event that he saw was aerial, and his camera was pointing to the ground. He saw a cigar-shaped uh, object pass by his own airplane. That was it. You mean he was also doing a mapping of the yes, ground? that's right. That's right. Wow. In Chile? Yes. Wow. We have the written report from yeah. him. <coughs> All right. Now, uh, a question that came up earlier is, um, is it really true that the FAA discourages pilots on coming forward about UAP encounters? And, and let's Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. This is the U.S. Yep. government. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, the FAA, and I've written about this in my book, actually has a, a manual that it's their employees' handbook or something like that, or manual for their employees, which tells their pilots and every, any other employee that if they see a UFO, they are not to report it to the FAA, but they're to go to a civilian organization, and that the FAA basically doesn't want to hear anything about uh, UFOs. It's not within their jurisdiction. So they, they send them to either the National UFO Reporting Center or to another group which was set up by um, Bigelow. What's his first name? Oh, yeah. You know who uh, I mean, yeah. who has the, sure. the space guy out in Nevada. Right. Um, anyway, and so it's, it's, it's true. I mean, the FAA does not like their pilots to report. And, and the, the pilots don't have any reporting forms they have no 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 uh you know way to report it even if they want to i mean for all these other obscure things like let's say volcanic dust or something like that that might be a, a danger to the aircraft or a laser beam that was shooting in through right. the um cockpit there are forms that they have to fill out for very obscure things but there's no forms for this i think they and have so a they're sort of stuck with the way to do it I think they also have a form for any flight dangers of any kind, you know, but that, you know, could loosely be used for that. But, yeah, they don't have any uh, forms. And another question, uh, or it continues, um, did you happen to see the uh, recent Obama pilot that came out about his major sighting? I thought that was uh, very well done. That was actually on Fox News, which I personally uh, never watch, but um, I thought the— uh, the video clip of it was very good. I wondered if you had a chance to see that, Leslie. I actually didn't. I have to confess I didn't see the video, but I did read the initial article that came out uh, which quoted him and, and in which he – I think he wrote that article himself. I think he – didn't it have his name on it initially? Possibly. Um, and, yeah, I did read about it, and I thought it was fantastic that he came forward like that. Absolutely. Right. Very, very interesting. Um, so, Leslie, again, we, we don't have too much time, but one of the things you mentioned real early on in the interview is that it wouldn't cost much to set up something that similar to what the Chilean government. I mean, we're spending money. Maybe maybe it, it doesn't cost enough. It has to cost a lot more before the government would be interested in spending the money. But it, it doesn't seem like it would be a real high expense. It's more or less cooperation from branches of the government, and uh, I believe the office, the CEFA uh, office, only has about five people. Am I right, or is it more the, that are in house? It has in four. Yeah, f four. Okay. Four full time staff. Yeah. And the thing is, in America, we wouldn't. I mean, what I'm advocating for is even less than that. Even if we only had one, two would be better. But even one person just sitting in an office, let's say within the Office of Science and Technology Policy or somewhere, that would initially just maybe even do a six-month assessment, that would initially be posted to do an assessment in cooperation with other governments, such as the one in Chile, as to whether this issue was worthy of the United States investigation. Uh, that wouldn't cost anything except the salary for the staffer. If the office was actually set up and there was a case that came along, it, it, as you say, Martin, what, what, what the Chileans do and what we could do here is to rely on experts from all these different areas uh, to, to give their time and lend their resources to this agency. So if we needed a, a weather expert or we needed a photo analyst or a soil expert or you know, whatever, something like that, there would be laboratories and resources available to this agency so that we would you – know, there might be some fees that would have to be paid, but basically uh, people can – people would contribute their their time and their resources, meaning their labs or their, their knowledge of weather, their knowledge of radar. A civilian organization can't get access to all the information that's necessary. That's the bottom line. And a government official, even just one person – if they, if something happens and there's radar, they can they can get that radar sent over to them immediately. Whereas a civilian organization has to file a Freedom of Information Act, uh, and then they have to wait forever, and then the thing might be destroyed or they might never get it. So you need even just one person who can order the information that to be supplied to them right away and do some kind of immediate. They can also 
order that the witnesses from an airline be interviewed by them. In the O'Hare incident, none of the witnesses uh, were interviewed. They wouldn't give their names. The O'Hare incident of 2006, if you had an, uh, a staffer in Washington who had immediate access to everything, he would fly right out, or she, fly right out to Chicago, and all those witnesses would have been interviewed on the record by that person. Hmm. So it's, it's so much of it is just having someone in place that has access to information, and that doesn't cost much. Right. Do you think um, a lot of the attitude, I don't know if you've ever looked into this, Leslie, or not, but uh, the Robertson panel back, I think it was 1952, uh, have you ever wondered, if you've, ha- if you've looked into that subject at all, have you ever wondered that that's mm-hmm. in part of the reason why the government is not, uh, you know, committing themselves to do anything like this? Well, I certainly think the Robertson panel had an effect on establishing a sort of an attitude of ridicule towards the subject back in the uh, 1953 was when it existed. And all through the, the life of Project Blue Book, I think that the conclusions of the Robertson panel certainly had an effect, which were to kind of undermine any civilian efforts. And, and, and they actually wrote in that, in that document uh, that they wanted to ridicule it and debunk it. I guess they use the word debunk. So there was sort of a, a, a recommendation for a policy of debunking that was set up through the CIA in this document, and that influenced the I'm, – I'm sure it influenced the media coverage and the Project Blue Book uh, attitudes of the employees there and so on. And, uh, whether it survived to – there's any direct relationship to what's going on today. I mean, it's hard to pinpoint it, but I think once Blue Book closed down – uh, this this issue was just so much kind of off the radar for government people. By the time Blue Book closed down, they just uh, had every excuse in the world not to pay attention to it, unfortunately. And and then the attitudes became so ingrained, the attitudes of not taking it seriously, that over decade after decade after decade, it just become entrenched in the thinking of and and of the culture and of the political establishment. And so it's been a long, long, long process with the Robinson panel as one component of it. I, I, I would agree. Uh, a one component of many that have influenced this unfortunate stalemate that we face right now. Right. Right. Um, what do you think? And we only have a few minutes left. Um, uh, just, just two minutes. And uh, I, I'm wondering uh, so make that about a minute and a half. I'm just looking right now. Uh, I'm wondering what type of um, advocate uh, in the public eye would be helpful. Do you think, first of all, I think it would be a death sentence as far as someone's political career um, to advocate UFOs. But do you think there could be another public person? Do you think that would have to be a celebrity or someone that would make a difference, could make a difference? Well, I think more more useful than a celebrity might be somebody, let's say, who is retired from public office or who's mm. some kind of a policymaker, a very influential player in, in Washington, but may not be uh, part of the, uh, you know, elected. He, he's not necessarily an elected official, he or she, uh, and does not have a lot at stake, isn't working for somebody who is running for office or that kind of thing. Uh Somebody who has good connections but is not running for office and therefore can afford to take some risks, if you see what I, I mean. I see. I'm sorry. I'm I have think to that cut. would be ideal. I think – yep. I'm sorry. We have a delay here. I'm going to have to cut it short. We're, we're out of time. Um, so, Leslie, quickly say your website, if you would. Um, my website is ufosontherecord.com, ufosontherecord.com, and I'm also on uh, an author page on Facebook, which very anybody good. can come on to. Well, thank you both very much. Uh, that's the end of the show. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I want to thank Alejandro Rojas for um, his news in the beginning and Peggy Shunning for managing the Facebook page. And that's it. We'll be back next week live right here on the Dark Matter Radio Network. <laughs>